Hello, everyone. Um, who's this bloke, you're all asking? Um, uh, my name's Graham Smith, <coughs> and I'm part of a production company called Grand Scheme Productions. And the reason we're here today is uh, I saw Strawberry Monday the first time round, 35 years ago, and that film always stuck in my mind. Um, I worked in Newcastle myself in the 80s, and so the film was, in, I found, incredibly evocative of the pre-transformation Newcastle, the way it was at the quayside. And the film always stuck in my mind. And my business partner in Grand Scheme Productions is from Newcastle, so we both have a very, very strong, uh, fond um, feeling ab about, about the city. And we started talking about the idea of maybe trying to create a thriller set in Newcastle because it's such an evocative setting. And I thought, well, hang on, it's, it's already been done. Mike Figgis did it 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I went back to Stormy and Monday, watched the film again, and remembered why I liked it the first time. And uh, first of all, I approached um, Nigel Stafford-Clark, the producer of the film. I think a round of applause for <laughs> Nigel Stafford-Clark. Uh, just because uh, we had the idea we wanted to try and see if there was a way that we could develop a contemporary television adaptation. And so I got in touch with Mike, and Mike thought it was a reasonably good idea. Mm. So that's what we're doing. So we're working together. Uh, we in the very, very early stages of developing a contemporary, updated um, evolution of, of Stormy Monday possibly with, with some of the same characters. Um, but as I say, it's very, very early days. We're just talking to writers at the moment, uh, just talking about essential, basic basic plot lines. Anyway, so that's the background to why we're here. And uh, I just thought, well, it might be a good idea to have a screening of the film again, because, uh, you know, it's, I've now seen it several times, and it's great when you see it again, and, you know, you realise how good the core acting is how good Melanie Griff Griffith is and Sean Bean have you know the even Sting and I sort of remembered the, watching it before that I thought Sting's accent wandered a little but you know I didn't feel that so much today and you know and obviously in a couple of scenes that there is genuine jeopardy um so that's why we're here I thought it'd be, it'd be a good idea to help us build the momentum of, of what we're trying to do in terms of working with Mike to try and develop this 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 new series um I'm going to ask a few questions we've got a few insider questions from within the figures corporation um and but there's going to be time for anyone who wants to ask a question uh, I'll shut up and then and then you can ask yours so I'm just going to kick off by asking about Mike just the history of the project, about how someone who's involved in experimental theatre, performance art, music, how that journey to you creating this neon-drenched, noirish Newcastle right. thriller. Right. I'll try. It's a long story, and I'll make it very short. Um, I, that was my background. I was with the People's Show for 10 years. I had my own theatre company, and I was primarily interested in... I studied music, uh, then kind of fell into performance art, became a kind of actor um, for my own theatre company, started making films as part of live performance, and was very happy actually doing that. Um, but then, as time passed, been more interested in making films. I would like. I bought a camera... Um, and I made a short film for one of my theater pieces called Red Hoof, which was a 40 minute uh, film on 16 millimeter. And I kind of got the bug. And so, uh, hmm, long story. Channel 4 was coming along at that point. That was the big like lifeboat for young filmmakers. Um, because to get into the ACTT, which was the union, was like Cash 22. You could only join if you were already in the union, basically. <laughs> or your mother was or something. It was so, it wasn't at night, it was total closed shop. And so I got a dispensation to make a one-hour TV film called The House, which Nigel produced. Um, and it was, uh, Roger Deakins shot it. We shot it on 16. 
Uh, it was um, my son, Louis, who's here tonight. We threw him down a flight of stairs. He was three. Um, um, that was a kind of, that got a reasonably good reception. One of the people who seemed to love it was David Putnam, um, who uh, I, I had a meeting with, who conveniently forgot that I'd met him the year before when I tried to get into the National Film School, and they basically told me to fuck off. Um, <laughs> But sometimes selective amnesia is, you know, the mode that one adopts. So neither of us mentioned that. That was a bit odd, a very odd meeting. <laughs> and he said, no, I'd love to make a film with you. So I um, did a treatment, <coughs> which he then carried around in his briefcase and never looked at for a year. I went back to teaching. And then one day, literally, I was in Soho in a tip um, outside one of the big advertising um, production houses. And I was offloading... Um, used reel-to-reel uh, audio tapes um, for my students into the back of my red Ford Cortina, a state car, um, secondhand. And, uh, and I heard this voice saying, Mike, and it was Nigel. And he said, what are you, basically, what are you doing in that tip? And I, <laughs> and I sort of explained, and, and we said, well, well, what are you up to now? And I said, well, I'm just trying to make this film. Um, but it's going nowhere, so I'm going back to teaching. So Nigel said, maybe this is not the right place to talk about it, but why don't you come and have a cup of coffee? He was then moving at uh, the moving picture company, and I went and had a cup of coffee with Nigel, and he read the treatment, and then he said, look, uh, very good advice for well, yeah, first-time film directors. He said, um, it's a very good treatment for four separate films, um, so when you're a first-time film director, you have the fe paranoid feeling that you'll never get a chance to make a film again. So every idea you have, a lot of very experimental ideas, go into one film. And so he said, I think some, you know, <laughs> some of the scripts in here are quite good. Why don't you choose one of them and then uh, we can talk about it. So uh, I did. And basically, uh, with Nigel's help, we, we shaped it into what became Stormy Monday, the script. And um, Mike, out of interest, what were some of those other narratives? There was a whole narrative about, um, I was trying to make a lot of social points that um, th during this American week, there, were, there was a rugby match going on and that the rugby supporters were much more v misogynistic, violent, unpleasant people than all the punks that also, that was another strand, you know. Believe me, it was complicated. Uh, <laughs> Well, we see glimpses of the punks. Yeah, with the native. That was nice. Well, yeah, and obviously that was oh, nice. That, that, yeah, little, that, that yeah. little reference with the punks with the Mohicans. Yeah. With That's the all. That, That's all that remained of the punks. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing was that was a scene in the script that called for like five hundred extras in a Chinese market, and uh, Nigel said, uh, uh, "We have to have a conversation about this." So <laughs> here's the budget. You can either have that, <laughs> and no other extras in the film ever, or you know, uh, we cut cut that scene. And I remember Roger Ebert, you know, I met him years later and he gave me a pen. And I went, oh, that's nice. It was a kind of like giveaway, you know, biro. And I went, he's going to read it. And on the pen for Roger Ebert's giveaway pen was, you know, cinema is a neon-soaked, wet street, lonely street at night. And I went, I should give this to Nigel because the... <laughs> Where was my Chinese supermarket? You know, where was my Chinese market? You know, uh, so you end up with this kind of lot of neon-soaked, empty streets. You know, so that was in, in an amazing setting because you always you always knew you were going to basically. Well, I grew in, up in there, Europe. you know, so yeah. And so you you already yeah. had an amazing and also set to in be the in the hiatus of David Putnam not reading the script. You know, and my family all lived up there. You know, every time I went up there, I went and found another location. You know, I took hundreds of photographs. I storyboarded it. I mean, I, I really did my, you know, due diligence. I knew exactly where I wanted to shoot each scene. I knew the Central Hotel, uh, Royal Station Hotel. Um, yeah, I'd found all the locations by the time we shot there. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's just talk about the casting, because, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I believe it's when an American distributor came on board that you then looked towards casting two well, very good... Again, I mean, this is, you know, a typical British film story. Um, Nigel and I, you know, we, we stayed on this project for quite a while. I mean, we're talking... First of all, Hemdale. So Hemdale, uh, that was um, 
David Hemmings and John Daly had a company, very, very successful. They had a bunch of British successful um, low-budget movies, and they loved it. Um, we had a guy called Bill Gavin, who was very famous, you know, distribution and you know, sales agent at that point. And we were set up with John Daly, uh, with uh, uh, Hemdale. Nigel and I went to Los Angeles, stayed in a fairly cheap hotel in Santa Monica, both got arrested for jaywalking, um, and n never got to meet John Daly. You know, we went all that way, but we did a lot of casting, and one of the people we met was Mele. Uh, I never met Tommy Lee, and that was all done by phone. Um, but we met Melanie. At that point, as far as they Americans were concerned, unemployable. You know, they didn't give a damn about her. I'd seen her in a Brian De Palma film, thought she was amazing, body double. Um, and then she did uh, the thing with Jeff Daniels, um, that really good something wild. something wild, Jonathan Demi's movie, and suddenly she was she was popular again. And so, you know, that's how casting goes anyway. But we went on that trip. New York and then Los Angeles, uh, very funny stories, uh, did a lot, of, met a lot of really interesting American actors, came back empty handed. We didn't, I don't think, we never even got to meet John Daly, you know, then they went bust. But had you, prior to the American trip, had you been thinking about British actors to no. play those roles? No, it was always an American, you know, my idea was like a jazz thing, you know, which is like, I always liked you know, British musicians with American musicians. And I wanted to make a kind of... The thing is, Newcastle is a very American town in the sense that, that all that kind of like cast iron and all that, you know, uh, post-industrial. It, it, you know, it's a great film place, you know. And I, I wasn't... I'm not a real Geordie. I, I didn't get arrive until I was mm, like nine or something, you know. So I became a Geordie very quickly to survive. But... Uh, um, then I had this uh, always a big romantic attachment to Northumberland and particularly Newcastle. And I just, you know, loved visually how it looked. And I, d I could see how it would film, you know. I'd met Roger Deakins through the first film we did, uh, Nigel and I did, The House. Uh, and he had now done 1984 and um, it was really starting to make his mark. And we were mates, and so he agreed to come in. I mean, the cinematography is stunning, obviously. Amazing. We talk about Roger. That's, uh, that's a source of many very funny stories. Cause well, uh, yes, I've got, I, I've, got, I've got a few of those yeah. from the, as I say, from the inner sanctum. Just bear with me. Yeah. Well, well, I can tell you what the questions <laughs> are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What did Melanie Griffith say to, uh, to uh, Roger Deakins, and what did Sting say? So Roger Deakins, who is, you know arguably the best cinematographer in the world right now, was not at that point, I called him Chuckles Deakins because he was the most miserable motherfucker you've <laughs> ever met in your life. You know, I was f more frightened of him than I was of Melanie. Melanie had, let's say, uh, some substance abuse problems at that time. Um, and <laughs> this was not an easy shoot, I tell you. Um, and, uh, but I would much rather, you know, you know, I was watching one scene when they, they go to the bar and there's that lovely Otis Redding song. That was the night her boyfriend ran off with one of the extras and she refused to act. And she said, I can't. I you know, she was sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And then I said to Nigel, she said, Nigel, she's sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And he said, you're the director. Tell her to get on the set. <laughs> and I went, Nigel, she's sobbing. He said, you're the director. Get her on the set. So I actually said, Melanie, get on the set. And she went, okay. <laughs> and she got on the set. And then she did that lovely scene where they're dancing. And she's talking about growing up in Minnesota. And it was like, blimey, actors. You know, <laughs> she was going to throw herself off a tine bridge. And suddenly you say action. And she literally went from, I don't want to act. Fuck you, I hate you. And action. I love you, Sean. <laughs> she just went like a uh, like proper actor. I mean, she's know. terrific in the film, isn't she? She's fantastic. Yeah. She's a fantastic actress. So she and Roger, Roger was, it with the, I think it was one of the scenes when they're going to make love and all of that. And Roger had set up camera quite low. And she went, Roger. And he said, yes. And he said, what lens do you have on? <laughs> and he said, it's 24 mil. She went, wrong lens <laughs> you want to put a 50 on and that camera's got to go a lot higher <laughs> she said otherwise i'm going to look like a beach whale she was quite right you know so he did it you know um sting did a trick with him because roger at that point had no social grace so the scene upstairs where that sean is looking out of the window waiting for the car to arrive 
you know, Roger, Roger would come up with his light meter and he'd literally go like this, you know, to take a reading. He'd never say, excuse me, or anything like that. So Sting always did the same joke and he would always say, yeah, Roger, you showed it to me yesterday. I'm going to get one for Christmas. They're great. <laughs> like every time. Nothing, you know. So Chuckles, that was Chuckles. Yeah. Um, t tell, tell us how Sting got involved in the project. Sting, well, he's a Geordie. Um, I used to play in a band in Newcastle with Brian Ferry called The Gas Board. Um, I am a few years older than Sting, but not that many, I have to point out. Um, he used to come and see the, my band, you know, before he was staying. I was sort of say, you know, I was his big influence, you know. Um, <laughs> but it, w the band I played in was like the top band in Newcastle and in the Northeast at that point, uh, and and kind of morphed into Roxy Music later on. So, um, so when uh, we put out a kind of, um, in fact, it was Bill Tennant who uh, suggested Sting, who was a very famous Hollywood character. He was. Um, Polanski's agent, he was Sharon Tate's agent, he identified the bodies, he then became a heroin addict, he vanished, he came back with this company Atlantic Releasing, was suddenly back in business. I met him, he was an absolutely terrifying character, who later became sort of my mentor, you know, so that's a whole different story, but he said, what about Sting? And now he's, uh, I've seen him in a couple of films, he's okay, I think he'd be perfect. Originally the part was for Albert Finney, um, yeah, so I mean, you know, this all takes a long time, this process, you know. So I said, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll, it's worth a try. I was in Los Angeles and he said, well, you know, they've set up a meeting, go and meet him, he's in Malibu. So I rent, had a rental car, I went to meet him, parked outside his house, went in and we had a great time because immediately it was, you must know Nigel Stanger. I went, yeah, of course I know Nigel and he played in the band with him and we had all these musician friends and and Newcastle, you know. And then at the end of that, he said, you know, well, look, that's great meeting. It sounds great. Let's keep talking. I've got to go. I've got to go to a meeting. And I went, well, it was lovely to meet you. He pressed a button, and it was one of those a metal shutter, you know, um, garage doors. And, and I just heard this kind of like <coughs> screeching noise as he completely scraped the side off my um, <laughs> rental car that I'd parked in front of his garage. <laughs> um, and then he said yes. And then Bill Tennant uh, <laughs> sort of said, look, you should get to know him. He's not, he's not a trained actor, but go and hang with him. So Sting was making that first solo album, um, Something the Sun, right? You know, with all nothing the... Like the uh, nothing, nothing Like the Sun. Like the sun uh, in Montserrat at that wonderful recording studio. And so Atlantic, uh, Bill Tennant said, you should go and hang with him. So gave me a, uh, like a... A, li a very nice ticket. I flew out. I flew out there, and I spent a week with him, um, watching him record that album, and just kind of getting to know him. Um, and and he, as part part of that process, did you do any tests with him? No, no. I took photographs of him. You don't test Sting. I mean, you know. I also a great believer that musicians, good musicians, actually have m a great potential to be good actors. They need help. So he. he he did things like he wanted to do a lot of cigarette acting and I tried to cut that out even though it's my first feature I kind of went no that's not going to look good a lot of actors when they're on you know nervous first time actors they often do too much with their hands and on big screen and all of that that's horrible so I remember one of the few directions I gave him was like you don't need to be drumming your fingers or and all that kind of stuff but he was pretty good yeah he oh, looked good yeah. Um, uh, how did you get permission to blow up a Jaguar in the middle of Newcastle? <laughs> okay, so uh, Willie Wands, who was our kind of line producer, I guess, right, sort of said, you know, because in the script it said, you know, it blows up when it's on a you know, busy night and everything, said, that could be a tricky one, you know, but we've set up a meeting with the head of the fire brigade, and I went, okay. So we said, I know, we had this weird location, and then this car pulls up, official car, and this tall guy gets out, very good looking, like six foot four guy gets out, walks towards me and he goes, hello, Michael. And I went, he says, it's Alan Smith. It's Smiggy from next door. I grew up next to you. You know, it's my next door neighbor on this council estate in North Kenton. I went, wow, how's your mom? And we just and he said, so you want to blow up a Jaguar? No problem. <laughs> <laughs> and that was on a Saturday night, I think, you know, in the, you know, whatever 10 o'clock at night under the you know under the bridge so yeah 
uh, <laughs> when you're from Newcastle, if you know the right people, you know, you get permission. Um, you've described Tommy Lee Jones as being scary. Yeah, e yeah. Please explain. He was um, very scary. And I already heard from somebody else, you know, that when he did the Executioner's song, maybe Nigel told me that he'd, he and Rosanna Arquette, literally he'd thrown out a, her out of a car. He'd pushed her out of a car at like 30 miles an hour. You know, so he's a beyond method. Um, and he was... He was deep, he was, he was scary. He was quite, you know, like very aggressive. And so when he turned up, uh, you know, things were going well. I started improvising a bit with the actors. And um, uh, we were shooting somewhere like the Polish club or something. And he, he turned up in Newcastle and he came to visit on the set. And I was shooting with Melanie and Sean. And uh, even Melanie said, he's scary, you know. Uh, and I went, yeah, he's a bit scary. And I, I never met him, just on the phone. And um, so he said, he's, going, he's in one of the trailers. Like, why don't you all have, you and Melanie have lunch with him? So I went, we went and said hello. And it was very polite at first. And then he said, so how's it going? And I said, it's going really well. I said, you know, it's and I, like first time director, you know talk about naive i said you know you know we started improvising um uh, quite a lot thinking that an actor would go that's great and he said oh improvising that's interesting uh, like what i said well you know the scene where melanie comes back to her apartment and it's been cleaned out and he went yeah i like that scene and i said and i'm thinking <laughs> i can't believe i said this i said as she walks in you just hear this kind of like shh he said what is that noise I went it's the noise of the shower and I said the apartment's empty but it's the opposite of psycho <laughs> somebody's in the shower <laughs> that's threatening and he said would that be me and I went yes and I'm realizing as he, from his voice this is not going well I said yeah that's yes that's you in the improvising in the shower and he goes <laughs> He said, uh, am I naked? And I went, <laughs> yes, I'm thinking naked. And he said, do I have clean underwear in the apartment? <laughs> I went, mm, I hadn't thought about that detail. It just got, you know, it just went downhill very rapidly. And he said, I learned this scene four weeks ago. I know every word of the scene. I prepared. You want me to take my clothes off and improvise naked in a shower? Am I understanding you? <laughs> and, uh, I went, that's really a stupid idea that I wish I'd never had. And no, we're going to really just stick to the script, Tommy Lee. Um, um, the other thing I notice yet again is is that it's funny. The film is funny. Yeah, it is he's, now. he's very, very <laughs> deadpan, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's great. And he also, like Melanie, because they're American cinema actors, They, I learned like so much from them. Like the scene when he comes in, he goes, what's his name, what's his name, Smith? Yeah, what's his first name, John, 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 John. He's John, you know, and he comes in and he's got that whole thing going. And, he's, and he said to me, where's your cut, where's your cut? And I went, what do you mean, cut? And he goes, where's your cutting point on the scene? I went, oh, I said, I'm gonna give you a cutting point. And he did something with his cigar. Yeah, John, 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 whoop, like this. And it was like, and then I remember, um, the editor going, oh, that's a great cutting point. You know? <laughs> because they know, like Melanie knows about, you know, her mum was an actor, you know, blah, blah, blah. They know about camera angles. So they're not going to be pushed around by a DP or a first time director, you know, not pushed around, but, you know, they're, they're going to help you. Let's put it the benevolent way. And once you got used to him, I mean, the end, the, the final Tommy Lee Jones, thank God Nigel put his foot down, was. We were shooting the American banquet scene, which is actually rather lovely, with the crack of jazz ensemble, you know, screwing up the star. He called it the star mangled banner. Um, <laughs> and we were just setting it up, and um, uh, you know, they were putting up all the flags and everything, and, and Tommy Lee and Melanie basically went on strike. And they said, you know, this is outrageous. And I said, well, what's up? And they said, the American flag never touches the ground. And the art department had like loads of American flags just ready to put up, you know. And then he said, on top of that, you've hired, you are, you are taking the piss out of America. 
you are mocking us. And I went, no, no, it's a kind of like ironic scene, you know, and he went, no. And they were really like, this took a lot of talking them back into the film, you know. They were really, really upset about it. Because Tommy said, I've just realized I'm in an anti-American film. And I went, I thought you read the script four weeks ago, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so uh, where was I going with that? The flags, Tommy Lee Jones, yeah. You know, he took it over there. So the end of the film comes, and they blow up the car, and we get the scene with Sean Bean coming with the gun. And it was the last night of the shoot, and um, Tommy Lee Jones refused to look at Sean Bean. And, you know, we did maybe 12 takes. And I kept, you know, and, and uh, I said, Tommy, could you, can we do one now where you actually look at him? So he was doing this kind of like, doing everything but looking at Sean Bean. He said, I wouldn't look at that motherfucker. Was Sean there in the reverse? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Sh no, it just hit my character wouldn't, I, you know, I'm such a cool guy. I wouldn't even look at the guy. He's got a gun. I'm not going to look at him because he's got a gun because I'm going to I'm going to front it, which I, is a good, good thought. But I did need him to look at him, you know, uh, and we tried and we tried and again. And then because we were on a fairly low budget, every time we did the scene, he'd take a Cohiba cigar and then and then throw it into the gutter. And, you know, the other thing that happens, Nigel said, you know, we are running out of cigars. <laughs> <laughs> How many more takes do you think? And I went, until he looks at him, you know. <laughs> so the props guys were then picking them up from the gutter, running back to the props truck, cutting them up, wrapping them up again. So he didn't know he was actually <laughs> s smoking garbage uh, cigars. That was my little, but I didn't get the shot. And then we looked at the dailies the next day. They'd already got on a plane. Uh, I think he was still at the Gosworth Park Hotel. Sting had gone. Um, and uh, Nigel and I looked at the dailies and uh, Nigel said, you know, you didn't get the shot, did you? And I said, no, I didn't. And he said, okay, I know what I have to do, get on the phone. So we had to get Sting back, fly him back, and then reshoot the whole damn scene again of just holding the gun. And again, he refused to do it. And up until that point, I'd been like, you know, I think it would be good. I mean, it's very strong what you're doing. I think maybe just a glance up would be good. You know, and that's all we need. Just one glance, please, Tommy Lee. And we're going again. Okay, and action. And it's like, <laughs> want to ride someplace, Kate? <laughs> it's like by now we're like, the cigars are getting shorter and shorter. And uh, eventually... How many takes in are we now? I don't remember, but at a certain point I lost it because it was the last night. And I, and I screamed, for fuck's sake, just look at him. And he went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And he did it, and then we went, okay, that's a wrap. Uh, why didn't I do that before, you know, because... And uh, he speaks so fondly of me, apparently. So, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it sounds like a very, very steep learning curve, you it know, doing very, that yeah, film. it was in, 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 in all kinds of things, like the Roger Deakins thing, and the f John Watson, the first assistant, at a certain point, because, you know, film sets get like this, he goes, you know, Deakins is stitching you up a bit. And I went, what do you mean? And he goes, you have great visual ideas. He said, but, you know, Deacons likes to run the camera. But, you know, you're a director. So, you know, be bold and push your ideas forward. So one of the last scenes we shot was the opening scene, pulling up in the garage, you know, the petrol station at night. And I'd worked out a whole shot where the camera's going to move around like this. And, you know, and I thought it would be good, you know. So I went, Roger, I've had an idea. And he went, yeah. And I went, uh, when the car comes in, what are we going to do? Track around, I go, this, and we do this. Because I'd learned all the lingo watching, you know, the camera department. And he just looked at me and said, just tell me when I turn the fucking button on. <laughs> Deadpan. And I went, oh, okay. No, 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 do it your way. It's fine. I mean, he was not going to. And that was the last time Roger and I ever worked together, you know. <laughs> On the first film, which was The House, he could not have been more uh, open to ideas and uh, collaborative. Uh, but it was the first film I ever made, you know. Um, it, was a, it was an odd one. And then years later, I, you know, I met the Coen brothers and I said, how do you deal with Roger? And he goes, it's very easy. We're the Coen brothers. <laughs> Good cop, bad cop, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's always somebody else's fault, you know, but and we have a working uh, working method. And he's mellowed a lot now, Roger, and obviously he's very good. He's fantastic. But it was tricky. So that was a learning curve, dealing with actors uh, on that scale. I mean, in that there's loads of performance art 
artists in that film. The guy who smashes the window, Ian Hinchcliffe, is a very famous performance artist. Uh, uh, Mark Long, who I was in the People Show for ten years, is one of the you know the gangsters. Um, Caroline Hutchison, I went to school with, who was uh, Sting's secretary, who sadly she died shortly after that film. Um, so it's really funny. I had forgotten Hethcote Williams, you know, who then I made loads of films with afterwards. Complete genius. That was the first time I worked with Hethcote. You know, Sandy Powell. That was her. I think you know one of her first films she did. Um, so yeah, it was pretty amazing. So just tell us about the next few years then, because you've made this film, which was, you know, it's a good film, and it's. But I have to say, it got hammered. This film came out here, it really got hammered. You know, it got the most unkind reviews, you know, it's like a blatant attempt by, you know, someone to try a calling card to Hollywood, blah, blah, blah. And um, I think the, the the variety review was that he should stick to doing rock videos. I'd never done a rock video, so it's like, it's like I couldn't even go back to it, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, and I remember I was in, I don't know why I was in LA, uh, but the, uh, the film was about to come out, I guess. And Jonathan Dana, who was one of the producers, rang me at like one in the morning in my hotel and said, you've got to see the reviews. Uh, in the New York Times, I went, no, I can't bear another one. He said, no, no, this is good. So uh, Janet Maslin suddenly gave it a rave review and it got a rave review in the LA Times. It suddenly became like a really cult, successful cult American film, which really did, actually was my passport. That led to internal affairs. But here it got, it was m treated fairly mercilessly. So were you quite surprised that you suddenly find your s yourself with your career absolutely taking off in America, but less so here? Because obviously three years later you're no, working with Richard I, Gere. It was nothing new. Uh, I mean, I'd worked in The People Show, which was successful everywhere but here. <laughs> to an extent, I mean, it had its little following here, but I think most artists at that point were used to the idea that it was tough, very tough in the UK. You either went to Holland or you went to America or you went elsewhere. And certainly, I mean, if you look at the roster of British filmmakers who'd by now gone to America, you know, it was for a reason, you know. Um, um, and um, I w by the way, I wasn't unhappy. I, I was always, you know, wanted to have that American experience because of my jazz background and all of that. So, uh, and I'd always seen cinema as being very closely related to jazz. So, yeah, I was intrigued to go and have the opportunity to, which was amazing, I have to say, to go from this to internal affairs where you suddenly go to a big, you know, Paramount Studios and a big production, you know, with the full weight of like... Um, sort of studio expertise and all of that that was pretty that was that was quite something yeah. now, obviously you're well known for having quite a jaundiced view about hollywood um but at that th those years <coughs> early 90s where you were hot and then even hotter how was that experience you know because you end up a, a few years later and you're oscar nominated and yeah, yeah, it wasn't like that <laughs> no no <laughs> what's the know. reality the reality was you know uh you kind of, uh, you're just ducking and diving. So you do the house, it gets some kind of attention, and it is enough to go to the next stage uh, with, uh, you know, Nigel, who had, a, you know, the backing of the moving picture company and British Screen, Channel 4, etc. So there's enough kind of conglomerate there to kind of get this little baby in the air. So... Um, and then almost, you know, like, okay, it gets shot at here, but then it gets, a, you know, a cool reception. Um, in Hollywood, I get an agent, you know, Clint Eastwood offers me a picture. I turn him down. He never speaks to me again, ever. Uh, I hate. What was the picture? It was called The Rookie, you know. Um, I think I dodged a bullet there. Was it, a baseball? was it a baseball movie? No, it was Charlie Sheen as a rookie cop, you know. He was so angry. Um, apparently, you don't turn Clint down. Um, plus, I did Internal Affairs, which was a good cop movie, right? So, uh, um, so Internal Affairs comes, and then I get this complete false sense of security because Internal Affairs. Not only w did I adore the process of being in America making a police movie, right, with all the kind of like that look, you know, and uh, John Alonzo who shot Chinatown, and you know, I mean, fantastic actors, and then the film is a kind of it's a big hit, you know. Um, I get to... And completely 
in a way reinvents Richard Gere. Yeah, I mean, it's always good to reinvent actors, you know, because then they're always happy um, and hungry. You know, the worst is to work with a very successful actor who's who's not hungry. They're just greedy, you know, um, or bored uh, or both, you know. So, yeah, always Nick Cage, you know, hungry. Hungry is always good. So the internal affairs is, is a good hit and then makes money. So the studio are happy. And then I kind of go, great, now I can make my passion movie, Liebestraum. Uh, yeah um you know which was just like wow i remember being at the preview for that and kind of having the preview organizer the guy who talks the audience through so what was your favorite scene what's your least favorite scene what do you think about the performances you know and he goes i don't know if it's any consolation but you scored lower than any film i've ever worked on (laughs) thank you so much for that um and it's not a bad film but i mean you know you suddenly experience okay it's really about luck and about being in you know the zeitgeist being aligned properly because if it's not you're screwed you know so you know uh so that film and then i went okay i then went on to mr jones a three-year disaster in the making you know again with richard Gere, uh, uh a horrible mortal combat with this disgusting man called ray stark um then the Browning version with Ridley Scott as the producer. Again, very combative experience and not a good result. And so by the time, you know, you're talking about success, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much beaten up by then. You know, Harriet, my agent at the time, is here. She can, she can uh, back me up on that. You know, we were really getting hammered. You know, and then the Leaving Las Vegas was a kind of like a fuck you. This is so miserable, this film. It's got such a miserable ending that no Hollywood studio will touch it. So I'm kind of, I'm safe. It has to be shot on 16. You know, it's an art house film. If I can get this made, it's almost like it'll redeem my soul, you know. But you were not expecting it to be hit, no, were you? No, no, no. no and it was a massive hit, wasn't it? It was a, it was a big, yeah. Uh, and that's that's what I mean, the irony of filmmaking. I'm just reading um, Sam Wasson's uh, Audio History of Hollywood, which I recommend to everybody. It's, it's one of the best books I've ever read on the film industry in Hollywood. It's incredible. Starts with in the mid-20s, pre-talkies, and then goes up to fairly recently, just all the you know going through easy rider chinatown all those films um and it's you know i i read it and it's like everything resonates because it's really about timing and the number of hurdles that you have to go through to get a film made and then to get it released and then to get it appreciated and if you can you know if you can win all of those like a video game then you're there but all you've got to do is lose one of them and you're screwed. You could have a masterpiece, whatever. You can have a piece of shit, and it can also be very successful if you hit the right buttons at the right time. Um, last question from me before we throw it open. Um, so tell me about Nick Cage, because Nick Cage is obviously he's developed into this sort of mm. larger than life oddball, well, I, I was <laughs> maverick uh, character. But you, you, you speak fondly of him. Oh yeah, he's brilliant. Um, I was at a a funny little Italian film festival a couple of weeks ago in Ischia, and I found myself on a boat with this young director who was the director of the Nick Cage as Nick Cage movie, right? And I went, oh, and he said, I'm so happy to meet you, you know, so we suddenly started. He said, you know, Nick speaks very highly of you, and I went, oh, great, you know, blah, 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 and he said he was very nervous about doing this film in case he looked bad, and, you know, so... I had a kind of um, sort of second-hand Nick Cage experience. And um, listen, I'll say this for Nick. Um, When I was trying to get the film made, there were two meetings I had which were casual. One was with Andy Garcia uh, in the Groucho Club. And and he said, what are you up to? I said, I'm making a film about an alcoholic who wants to kill himself, and he does. Are you interested? And he went, no, Mike, no. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, what else are you doing, you know? Pretty much the same conversation with Richard Gere, you know, and he goes, good luck with that one, baby, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, Ed Lamato, who re- represented Nick, was the most wonderful of the last of the great old agents. Um, he gave it to Nick. And uh, I, I've somewhere, I've got it, but it's faded because it's a fax. And, uh, you know, the awful thing about fax is they do in time, they become white paper again, right? But it said something like, it was from Mr. Spooky Blue, which was his 
name that he checked into hotels with. And he said, I beg you, do not give this script to anybody else. You know, I beg you, I don't care what the budget is, I want to do it. And so I, that was that. Same with Elizabeth Shue. So but pretty much those two parts were cast way before any kind of process happened. And Nick paid for a suite at the Chateau Marmont for two weeks for us to rehearse. And he paid. Um, he rented a Rolls Royce and a driver so that he and I could... He, I didn't do this. He wanted to, to get drunk every night for, t for two weeks, go to strip clubs, go to you know lap dancing clubs. I went one night with him and I went, okay, I need to survive. Um, uh, but um, he was incredible. You know, he was wonderful. Now, this is a perverse story, right? He was wonderful. I keep notebooks, and very interesting thing about notebooks, the act of writing something down often clarifies a question that you have in your mind, right? So when we finished the film, Leaving Las Vegas, I was in touch with him, and he said, I, I'm dying to see it. You know, I said, well, I'm coming to L.A., I'll bring a tape. So it was off the Avid, so it was like a... I don't know, was it a VHS? Or, I think it was a, maybe a Betamax or something, right? So I turned up and he said, this is great. We're going to have cocktails and then I'm going to make dinner and we're going to watch this and celebrate. And I went, okay. So I got in my little car. I lived in, in Beechwood and he was up in the Hollywood Hills. This was pre-Satnav. So he like it was really like, when you get to Laurel, turn right. When you get the next one, it's a left. And the next one, don't turn left. You know, eventually I kind of like, uh, 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 and I just got off the plane. I got to his house, which was a faux castle in the Hollywood Hills. And my Mike, great to see you. And I come in, and you know, so he's like, immediately mix this massive cocktail and, get, get, and handed me a Cohiba, right? And I went, great. And he said, well, let's watch this, you know, so we put it on. <laughs> and he kept mixing drinks all the way through. And I literally, I just got off the plane, so I was already like crazy jet lag. And we get to the end of the film, and, I, and I'm, I'm thinking, I am smashed. I need to eat something soon. I hope dinner's soon, you know. <laughs> so then he, he just went, wow, 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 wow. I'm so glad I did this movie. Um, and we should stay in touch. And uh, starts walking me towards the door. <laughs> he said, we're going to have dinner. You know, and he said, uh, I've got to go and meet some models and guys at a club. You know, it'd be boring. You know? But anyway, Mike, bravo, bravo, bravissimo. <laughs> you know, and, I'm, you know, like, and he pushes me out the door. I am off my face drunk. <laughs> it's a Friday night. It's Los Angeles where they kind of execute you for being drunk in a car, right? You know? And I get in my little car, and it's just like, and it's now it's just getting dark, and my car's been in a garage for six weeks, so it's got kind of oil on the on the window, and um, and I head off down the hill. Now I kind of like fuck the left and right. I mean, sooner or later I'm going to hit Franklin because I'm going downhill. So I go down, and it's like, and it's now it's raining. I put the wipers on it, and it goes like like this, and it's like a Renoir immediately. It's just like an impressionistic. <laughs> And it's an old car, so the headlights aren't great. And it's like a canyon road. And I finally, I kind of like, I should have hit, I really should have hit Franklin by now. It seems like a, like a rural doll story, you know, where you count the stairs on the way up and then there's many more on the way down. And so I keep going, I keep going, this is crazy. I should definitely, be like, finally I hit the main road and went, thank God. So I turn right, because that's going to take me to where my house is. And, um, and then I suddenly go, I don't recognize anything out of the window now. And also, I'm just paranoid because I'm really drunk, and and it's now getting dark. And they are militant there; they 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 do handcuff you and they put you in jail. And so eventually, I thought, this is crazy. I don't recognize anything. I, I'm losing my marbles. I stop the car. I get out by a sign because I can't see through the window. And then I get my Thomas guide out, and I kind of go look it up. And I went, oh my god, I'm in the valley. So you know, you go up the hill in Hollywood, and if you go down the hill the wrong way. You're in the other side of, uh, you know, Los Angeles, which is huge. So I'm now in a completely alien part of town, and uh, I don't know where I am. And eventually I hit Mulholland Drive, and, and then I kind of go, okay, if I keep driving. It takes me about an hour and a half to get home, drunk. And anyway, so maybe let's say a year ago, I was writing this down as an anecdote, and I suddenly went, it was so weird. Oh, my God. He thought the film was a failure. I didn't get dinner, you know. <laughs> Because he'd said, come and have dinner, 
bride. And then he kind of watched the film and went, no dinner. <laughs> no dinner for Mike, you know. But Mike, wowie, 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 bravissimo. <laughs> you know? um, we're, we're really pushed for time. Questions? Anyone with a question? Hands up. Anyone with a question? It's a great opportunity. Hi, hi. Um, really, enjoyed seeing, really enjoyed seeing Story Monday and really enjoyed your anecdotes. You've had a fascinating career. In the De Palma documentary, Brian De Palma says something which resonated with me. He said, as a director, you can't plan your career. Would, do you believe that's true? And um, were there any plans you had that didn't come to fruition? And were there things that you didn't plan for that did? Because that's what he kind of talks about. Yeah, I mean, you know, they say it's a collaborative process. And I always argue with that, I, you know, because I think ultimately the film has to be, have one singular vision. However, to create one singular vision, you do need a lot of other people to help you, unless you're making an experimental film with just yourself. So... I uh, like the story, you know, we're talking about Nigel sort of saying, you, you have four scripts here, make a choice about which one you want. So you you modify and moderate your plans as you go along. And as this book, the Sam Wasson book, which, you know, every director that's interviewed says the same thing, you know. You have you start off with a vision. You know, Bob Rafelson, who I interviewed, who's a wonderful guy, said, sometimes when you, by the time you get to make a film, you've forgotten why you wanted to make it. You know, because it's been so long and you've become a different person. And I mean, it's like, I wouldn't make that film now. I'm, my brain is somewhere else. And uh, he's quite right. You know, that process, how long this took from putting it in, you know, um, what's his name's, you know, David Putman's briefcase, then the first, you know, uh, cycle that Nigel and I went through with Hemdale, uh, then it got picked up by Atlantic Releasing. Then I, I I got on a plane and went out there again. So yeah, you modify, and if you can't modify and also keep somehow some eye on the road, the, the, the vision of the road that you had, you know, then you won't you won't you won't get through. You really won't. So I was going to say, you know, perseverance, patience, and uh, and a, a kind of insane belief in your original idea is quite useful. I think. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thanks so much for tonight. Um, are we going to get a figures on figures book from these anecdotes yeah. and notebooks? Um, yeah, um, I, I, I keep uh, I, I I carry a little book with me, and it's called um, Unreliable Mem Memory. <laughs> so when I because so often what happens is you kind of go, ah, oh, I've forgotten that story. That's amazing, you know, and I must write that down. By the time you get home, you go, oh, fuck, what was that? It's gone, you know, like a dream. So now I carry this notebook and I just write one line. Go, okay, that's your that's your um, your prompt. And then when I have a moment, I just do, you know, whatever, it's a paragraph or a page or whatever on that thing. So I called it a uh, non-sequential anecdotal biography, you know. Uh, but obviously you need to do the audio book because you're quite good at telling the story. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, if they pay. <laughs> uh, anyone at the back got a question? Uh, right at the back, right in the corner. Thank you. Um, Stormy Monday question. Um, I love the scene with um, Sting and Tommy Lee Jones when they meet up in person. It all plays out as a big wide master. Was that your intention or was that kind of budgetary that didn't give you time to punch in and, and shoot any tighter to with that? I mean, I think it works brilliantly. I yeah. love it. I mean, Chuckles Deakins is a master, you know. <laughs> Uh, and so, some, you know, when you're working with someone who is that good, and actually his work on The House, which was the first film, was also extraordinary. Um, so while, you know, the first AD was right saying, you know, you have your push your own idea, this was my first feature film. And, you know, it's kind of, I can't find fault with a single shot in the film. It's, it's, it's you know, the interior club lighting is spectacular. Um and to have, because Roger has such a good cinema brain, to hold that in the master is just, that's fantastic. I'm so glad. I, I don't know if Nigel remembers. I, I wonder if we did any closer sort of medium shots. But it would be silly to do that when you've got, it's really about that bridge, you know. And, and so many of the shots, I, when I look at it now, um, I have such respect for because... Uh, of 
like in the Polish club, there's an incredible shot in one take, a lot of single take stuff. So yeah, um, there are times where if you're working with someone who's really, really good, you just as much as possible go with, I mean, I have to say this, DPs will also beat you up. Uh, and you take a film like, I'd say, I don't want to be bitchy, but American Beauty, where clearly the DP has kind of directed the movie. I mean, you know, every shot is too perfect, too symmetrical, too kind of, too DP, you know. Whereas Roger, I think, is more, you know, I think he has a more filmic, you know, he wants he wants to move in a certain way. It's the combination also of, of the settings, because yeah. it's, a, it's a wonderfully <laughs> photographic visual oh, it's amazing it? yeah and the sun is just coming up and it's like and we know that you, you know all those stories about if you don't nail that shot in the next 10 minutes you're not going to get it you know and there's quite a lot of dialogue you know and they have to stop and there are marks and so on so that was that was uh that must have been that must have been quite tricky to do i'm sh i think we did maybe two takes or three takes at the most of that uh, we've got time for one more because we, we're running over yes Thank you. That was really fascinating. And I love the film as well. Um, I just wanted to ask you about House, the film you're talking about. Where can anyone see that? <laughs> Which one? House. The House. Oh, The House. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know, actually. I mean, it's a, you know, Channel 4. Um, I can put it on Vimeo quietly. <laughs> you know, um, why not? You know, uh, again, very, very beautiful. Uh, can do a screening of it. Yeah. 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 Oh, amazing. there's a very funny yeah. story about that actually because when we were casting Stormy Monday and another of the actors we were looking at was Alan Bates a wonderful actor and so we set up a screening on 16 millimeter of the house for Alan Bates and uh, somewhere in Soho in one of the screening rooms and this was my first technical challenge in terms of the technicality of screening and they, they started running it and it was out of sync um, and I was like, oh, God, it's a disaster and that. And I can't remember, Nigel, somebody came to me and said, it's out of sync. And I know, How far out of sync? And I did a calculation and I said, I think it's about, whatever, 35 frames out, you know, which just must have been, how the fuck did I know? <laughs> you know, it's just like, I knew it was, knew which way it was. And I sort of thought, because uh, it was like, Hello. Uh, you know, so it's like, it's quite close. And it, I'd shot in the dark and they I'd somehow adjusted it and it came back into sync. Yeah. But, um, and I think actually I've got, I think I've got a print of the house actually. Yeah. I've got a 16 millimeter print of it. Yeah. So, so we need to go to a proper know, cinema. Any, <laughs> yeah. But has anybody got projectors anymore? No. It's all digital. Okay. Vimeo then. Right. <laughs> um, put your hands together for Mike Figgis. And I'd just like to uh, thank you for doing this, um, and it's really been a pleasure. Um, I have not seen it for a long, long time. I mean, really, 30-something years. That's the last time I saw it. So it's quite interesting. Nigel and I were both saying, it's just like how instantly the dialogue comes back. You kind of, I, you start, I, kind of, I know what he's going to say next. It's very weird, like a dream, you know, so there's that. Um, and thank you, Nigel, for actually supporting me. Um, basically jump-starting my career because you know we did my first two films with with Nigel and uh, he was very faithful and severe sometimes and I like at one point Bill Tennant said do you need more money I'm going to give you more money and Nigel said no more money no more money because <laughs> we'll have to pay for it at some point you know and then Harriet Cruikshank who also at that point you know uh, had rep started representing me who uh, you know coming from the not exactly commercial world of performance art um, and then again on that journey of uh, you know um, apart from anything else securing an American agent you know uh, which was one of the one of the interesting things that happened on the shoot was there was a bit of a buzz because obviously they're American actors and then a, a lovely guy called Michael Simpson from the Morris office actually flew over and I thought wow why, why would it do you have it the business here? No, he said, I'm flying up to see you because we want to sign you. And it was like, after all these years in the British film industry, it was like, you want to sign me? Oh, you know. Someone it, actually showing enthusiasm. Someone showing enthusiasm, <laughs> like as opposed to the ACT saying, you get a temporary mem membership, that's it. Doesn't mean you're in the union, you know. So anyway, uh, 
Um, thank you so much, Harriet. Thank you very much, Nigel. And thank you for coming this evening.